Since 2011, the Palestinian Authority has embarked on a campaign with the United Nations to gain recognition for a state of Palestine in the so-called West Bank, with Jerusalem as its capital. The intention? To bypass any negotiations with Israel and thus avoid making any compromises without which peace cannot be obtained. Several of the national parliaments within the European Union, as well as the European Parliament itself, have recognised de facto Palestinian statehood. A number of UN agencies, including UNESCO, have admitted Palestine into membership, thus giving the Palestinian Authority de facto recognition as a state. By accepting the Palestinians and upgrading their position, the international community gave the Palestinians a clear message. You don't have to negotiate directly with Israel. You could circumvent and try and impose a solution without sitting on the negotiation table. I think you can see the whole behavior of the, of the Palestinians since then as understanding that the more they say no in direct negotiations with Israel, the more they get yes from the international community. And it's very, very clear to see that. So what the Palestinians and the PLO in particular are doing by, uh, by going to the UN, claiming statehood based on the 49 lines, I believe is conflicting fundamentally with the Oslo Accords. Now, if the UN goes ahead and does that, and particularly if European states vote for that at the UN and then recognize the state subsequently, what they're involving themselves in is an act of illegality, and I'll explain why. The original Oslo agreements, the first one in 1993, the big Oslo agreement in 1995 known as the Interim Agreement, had a clause in them. It was called Article 31, and it said, neither side shall change the status of the West Bank and Gaza Strip prior to the completion of the permanent status negotiations. If the Palestinians try and change the status of the territory without negotiating with Israel, that is a unilateral act which violates this commitment. Now, why is this particularly important for Europe? Because when the interim agreement was signed with that critical clause, at the White House, in the presence of President Clinton, the European Union signed the agreement as well as a witness. And therefore, if EU countries decide to support the Palestinian move in the UN in contravention of that Palestinian commitment in Oslo, what they're essentially doing is lending a hand to a violation of a written agreement to which they've also, they are also signatories. In the final days of the Obama administration, the United States withdrew the protection it had consistently given to Israel over nearly seven decades against blatantly anti-Israel resolutions in the Security Council. On the 23rd of December 2016, the United States withdrew its veto of Security Council Resolution 2334, referring to the so-called 1967 borders the resolution condemned Israel's occupation of the so-called Palestinian territories as a flagrant violation of international law. I published a book, it's called In the Lion's Den, and for me the most significant part in the book is telling the story of what happened that day in the Security Council. I was in the Lion's Den by myself. Even the U.S. was against us. Uh, but I knew that I had the support of, of many, many uh, Jewish supporters, Christian supporters, that knew that we have rights to the land. Uh, for me, it was an unforgettable moment when that such a shameful resolution passed. And I want to remind you, you what it said in the resolution. It called our presence in Jerusalem, in the old city of Jerusalem, and I quote, a flagrant violation of international law. That's the language the U.S. chose to use about our presence in Jerusalem. What is forgotten is that the Green Line was simply an armistice line. This is the line chosen between Israel and the, the Jewish people and the Jordanians when they stopped fighting in 1948-1949. Uh, 
That line, it is specified in the treaty, in the armistice agreement between Israel and Jordan, was never intended to be for anyone the source of rights and obligations. There's nothing sacred about it from an international law point of view. And those who seem to have forgotten these fundamental principles of international law, I believe, do so deliberately. It's good to remember that the United Nations is not a legal body. It is a political body. The UN does not have the authority to make law. The UN does not have the authority to demand any sovereign country to do anything legally. It is recommendatory with the caveat about Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The Security Council, for the first time, because the United States decided not to veto the resolution, made a determination that every settlement established after 1967 is a flagrant violation of international law. Again, that strikes me as a, a political statement uh, rather than a legal one because it is without foundation um, in international law. And the suggestion that uh, the presence of Jews in Judea and Samaria uh, is in some way illegitimate or unlawful uh, is, I would suggest, a morally repugnant stance uh, to take. It uh, bears great similarity to the position that the area needs to be uh, cleansed of its Jews. Um, and that, of course, bears uh, a worrying resemblance to the Nazi policy of areas becoming free of Jews or cleansed of Jews, Judenrein. To claim that Israel has a legal obligation to make sure that there are zero Jews living in the heartland of ancient Israel is simply without basis in international law and grossly immoral. All of this again comes down to the question of the status of the territory uh, and the underlying uh, rule of uti possidetis juris. Uh, that undermines all of the arguments uh, that Israel's presence in the territory is anything other than entirely lawful and that Israel is indeed the underlying sovereign. Resolution 2334 conflicts with the Oslo Agreement to the extent that it tries to circumvent the requisite for bilateral negotiations. It is an attempt to have the United Nations uh, make decisions that in fact are reserved to the two parties to the conflict. Do they have a right to make a determination? Do they have a right to enforce their will in this? No, they don't. Now, another fundamental principle of international law is its equal application. You can't have a general rule and an exception for a country you just don't like very much or you have some political or ideological opposition to. That is not how any respectable legal system can operate. Today, even today, there is such a thing as state sovereignty. Um, and I know this is a, a complex area of law, there are differences of opinion, but the fundamental idea that it's nation states who are sovereign is, I think, still fundamentally part of international law and it underlines uh, the United Nations uh, Charter in every way. Article 80 of the UN Charter, which is an international treaty, which is a source of rights and obligations, specifies that all of the rights given to any people prior to the execution and ratification of the UN Charter are to be protected, observed, and honored. This is part of the UN Charter. I believe that Resolution 2334 would be in breach of Article 80 of the UN Charter if it were enforceable, but it's not enforceable because neither the General Assembly nor the um, Security Council has the power to make that enforceable. And this is very important. I, I think the public perception is more problematic than the, the legality of the resolution. I knew it was illegal because it goes against the resolution that passed in, in San Remo, it goes against the UN Charter, and I told my colleagues in the room 
that we will overcome this shameful resolution. We will continue to build in Jerusalem. We will continue to bring Jews to live in the land of Israel. Twelve months after outgoing President Obama allowed Resolution 2334 to pass through the Security Council, President Donald Trump announced that the United States government would be moving its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Distinguished guests and dear friends, Tammy and I welcome you to the opening and dedication of the United States Embassy in Jerusalem, Israel. The grand opening took place on the 14th of May, 2018, the 70th anniversary of the rebirth of the State of Israel. I was privileged to be among the invited guests to witness this historic event. In 1995, the Jerusalem Embassy Act became law, voted in favor overwhelmingly by both houses of Congress and led, I should add, by a former senator who is here today, Senator Joseph Lieberman. As we've seen the move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, I'm very elated with this uh, personally because I've been involved in this battle for over 25 years now. I co-wrote the original draft of the Jerusalem Embassy Act in 1995, so it's a wonderful moment. I feel an achievement, all the work that uh, I put into it, that the Christian Embassy and so many other Christian organizations have put into it over the years, standing with the Jews. And I found it remarkable how that alone, standing with them uh, in their ancient attachment to Jerusalem and saying, we get it, we understand, God attached you to this city. It is a great comfort to our Jewish friends. First of all, we are grateful for that very bold decisions. You know, many presidents promised to do it, and President Trump actually did it. Uh, and I know that there was a lot of pressure against that uh, implementation of the decision. I was very involved, and together with Ambassador Nikki Haley, we planned our move in the UN. We knew it's going to be uh, challenging for us. You know, we didn't come to the ceremony here in Jerusalem because we knew we have to defend the decision in the Security Council and in the General Assembly. And for me, it was very important to show that, you know, we should take the right decisions if you, you have to deal with the pressure from other countries. I want to thank Jared, Jason and David for your tireless efforts to advance peace and for your tireless efforts to advance the truth. The, tru the truth and peace are interconnected. A peace that is built on lies will crash on the rocks of Middle Eastern realities. You can only build peace on truth. And the truth is that Jerusalem has been and will always be the capital of the Jewish people, the capital of the Jewish state. There's no doubt in my mind that the Jewish people, from the perspective of international law, are in Jerusalem as of right. They are not there as trespassers. They're not there as occupiers, if you want to use that in a negative sense. They're not there wrongfully. They're not there illegally. If you study their history, there's a solid, solid basis for their claims in respect to Jerusalem. If you study their religious beliefs, their religious texts, there's a very solid basis for their claim. And if you study the law of nations, as I have, international law, their claim to Jerusalem is very solid. Again, my conclusion is that they are there as of right. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. And I will give to you and to your descendants after you all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. This is a deed to our land. <laughs>